realized recently about long-term change processes and the thing of problems always coming back where sometimes other persons that have a similar mind to another person that the process stopped with for, for a reason in the past connected to performativity in a way for me finding a role or finding a character and knowing character and then applying character in a situation with another process that I left off with one person because the emotional connection didn't work out for me anymore because the history was affecting the emotions too much. Now the process can go on in the same character with a similar character in another situation. That's some something that's really interesting for me in a storytelling point. Like what I learned now with a lot of filmmakers and how they're portraying characters, how I'm reiterating the same story with different perspectives, like that actually the one who is writing or holding the camera or building the script, all these characters, how they are important to have a certain timeline like how time is actually something that's very something you can grip and something where I can be something that I learned only because of the of this constant process of re reiteration and I see it now because some of the this film night that we have with a lot of young filmmakers who are, like made their first film or where I see a lot of a basic story that's in the Q&A where they say where they either are not open enough to tell their emotions that led to this story or don't know the emotions that led to the story but I've heard the same story so often and felt the story so often because I can go into character and feel where this is coming from and to have this different perspectives on the same story and know that we instinctually know what this is coming from because we're so similar but having this connected in the spirit of another time like, this is extremely enlightening for me because you, t you talk about repeated themes even in life and to see personal examples like the theme that's been like literally knocking me in the head both in terms of where my compassion fatigue is and the trauma stewardship I do in my community and in uh, an old theme that's reappearing in my life is this concept of the helper and where do you put the healthy boundaries and when do you say no and how do you tune into capacity and boundaries. And I went through massive processes with this already. So like I think oftentimes when these things reappear and then they're reappearing in all these characters, you're like, did I not learn my lesson? But it's, it's still very interesting because like you said, these things are coming back. And I would I would say, like you're saying, that the, the new people and the new timelines have new nuance for this lesson. And I also just feel like I have more hindsight because rather than doing that thing of like, why is this here again? I'm doing this thing of, oh, there's a new nuance that I need to be searching for because this is a continual process of growth and expansion. And so I'm actually even more excited about it rather than confused. <laughs> <laughs> because I honestly feel like that is really strongly in place now in a way it wasn't. I've also noticed all of the positive benefits of learning the lesson, which is almost counterintuitive. I think I'll tell the story like when I first was like, okay, you need to stop helping. And it really felt like a cosmic transmission I cried about it. I was like, I do not understand how helping could be wrong, could be not the direction to go. And then from there, I started helping more complex systems because I wasn't being burned out in interpersonal dynamics. You know, I wasn't putting that helping context all into one person that wasn't ready to receive it, that I would feel kind of heart hurt about. Uh, and instead, I was able to do more help on a larger level. So I feel like I, I have actually really great boundaries in place. And even with pride organizing I was doing today, my my friend was saying, oh, we did all of this stuff and we were supposed to be compensated last year and, and it didn't happen. And I'm like, here they're going on venting about this. And I'm like, you need to have a clear idea of the budget going in at the start and have those agreements in place, including potentially, since we're now talking about bigger sponsors, getting those prior agreements met. And I just don't understand while you're venting about it, why don't we have systems and processes in place that are going to 
dissuade this from ever even happening again and to take care of it, like agreement setting. Uh, I was hosting quite a few people and I had to look at it. I was like, am I getting back into this helper mentality? And I was like, no, actually, I realized that the truth of it was that I wanted to live the world that I wanted to see. Then I put a boundary in place after a certain amount of time. I said, I really need compensation for this room. I'm going to stop just offering it out to every friend. Um, but um, at the time, I had to dig deep about why am I doing this? And it was like, because I want to live in a world where people are they open their door and they draw you a bath and they cook you a meal. So that's why I'm living it for a little while because you don't often see that. And yeah, you have to have boundaries so that you're not constantly bleeding out, uh, trying to provide it, but also you kind of have to have breaks into what is this quote unquote utopia I want to live by being it. For me, a lot of long-term perspectives in what bigger topics are at stake right now, like what direction can I understand things in, like what layering up, like sedimenting sev several things, building up knowledge and then applying it and for example like there's uh, in berlin right now next week there will be a camp at the airport uh, against uh, the deportation business and there's been a lot of problems now because state repression is going hard and they build up a lot of the camp infrastructure and i know some people have really put in a lot of energy and now the campsite wasn't allowed and so it's not about the energy put in but that a lot of the people forgot that there's actually a fight going on <laughs> i think and that's something that um, i was frustrated with activist spaces or like progressive culture altogether that people forget that there are people working uh, other people working against what our utopia or our dreams are this is uh, emerging in so many places right now and some something where i can provide knowledge to people now and now that i started talking about it i really see how people <laughs> come with open arms and that i can articulate what they can't articulate because of some experiences i had and for me this is a very difficult but needed topic in connecting fights that we don't have a lot of intercultural room for talk, which I saw in a, an in initiative now where I'm part of against the de deforestation of a like small piece of forest nearby where I live, where there was not is now a big fissure in uh, how in the group because everyone thought we were on the same page what we wanted but there's a, a very different needs for this fight like some people being more in a classical political way some people just wanting to go with their children into the forest some people being very aware of climate topics some people just not wanting the rents in their uh, neighborhood to go up and again this uh, what i realized is that by not doing the small fights in our groups, we unlearn fighting in a bigger group, learning that a fight isn't a bad thing. It conflict that... leads to growth. Yeah, it's kind of the same way of how you stress the plan and then it's stronger, but you have to go through that process. I mean, I definitely notice this a lot in organizing spaces that they miss some of those small steps. And they're so gung-ho to get toward the action or some of the organizing process that they don't remember to do some of the foundational stuff. It was kind of what I was saying about the defining the term racism and how my, what I found having done this for over a decade is that 80% of the people don't even know what the word means. And yet there's endless programs that go on and on that very rarely start with, and this is how you define the word. And so then like creating systems where people can contribute in the way that they want to I mean, it's great to have a collective intention, but sometimes if you have different intentions, but you want the same goal, then how do you make sure that you can have contributions along the line without stressing them? And then like, for instance, it reminds me of, I've worked with a lot of intersectional groups and I worked with an um, advocacy organization in the Pacific Northwest in the US. And we would have people that would often say things that were borderline racist but they wanted to work on climate change and they were consistent in their engagement on it. So when we had these intersectional summits, you know, it's really important to be like, hey, they, maybe this person has a somewhat ignorant, you know, 
stance within this particular social justice category and those groups, you know, should maybe be monitored in terms of who can come into them so that if they're, for instance, led by a person of color or a person of color elder, that what's happening isn't like highly problematic, which is what we saw. But then again, the person, when they're called on their problematic behavior, then feel like they need to pull away from what they're doing in terms of the climate struggle. And we want more bodies on the line. So I'm always big on like, let's build bridges and not be divisive. And I don't know if I've told you the story about uh, working as a political ecologist for the far right in Lund University in Sweden. And they were looking at how uh, fascist co-op liberal narratives to further their agenda. And I said, would you ever consider, you know, opening the conference to people who identify as fascists or on the far right? And people were so adamantly against it. And I was like, well, a lot of these people are youth who haven't completely gone through their identity formation and have the potential to hear these dialogues and have changed. And, you know, I'm talking to white women at this time. And I'm like, if I, as a person of color, can consider this, I don't see why it's so beyond the realm for you. And then, like, years later, I met someone here in Lagos, Portugal, actually, who had been a former fascist. And it was interesting because he talked about the fascist camps. And, like, it was interesting because considering how alternatives gather, it sounded very similar. Uh, And, you know, he was a current anarchist uh, and talking about like this process. He was talking to a queer friend of mine about his process of making these changes. And I was like, well, I've actually argued for you in spaces where you've never been, you know, you were that person that I was like, we're not so overly defined. And most certainly we should be building bridges and not being divisive so that we can really kind of build momentum and have more people power on these fights. But it does, sometimes it really gets into that uh, it's, it's the, the inner fight can be problematic, but also the inner fight can be resilience building and it can be clarifying and it can be strengthening. So we do have to do that work. Yeah. And for me, a lesson also from the camp, the stop deportation camp, or also from our short film nights where we had yeah cases of people being racist in the Q and A and reaction to that being really short like not wanting to discuss it in a plenary group like opening it up and showing that this was racist but like not discussing it but thing is then also when is the moment to discuss this and for my experience with that often with the atmosphere then it's often that a lot of people don't feel confident enough in their argumentation that they can confront people and thing is like on the other side i think also the arguments are not like spelled out or like thought through and that a culture of discussion is something that's so important and that's getting lost a lot like what i also see in a way that mass organization and here social struggles happens through online means and that very often, if a ch- if a group or a channel or a, uh, email distributor is used for talking about a problem, there's a hard backlash <laughs> on anyone who uses it, except for the official purpose. And uh, yeah, oh my goodness, I definitely have to respond to both of these because one, if that's kind of my specialty as far as theater and social justice is I do these dialect practices and I use like a modified theater of the oppressed to actually have people walk into these faux pas and conversation that are so recurrent, they're actually a textbook, I say, and the textbook is actually Dr. Seuss, like multi- textbook on multicultural competence counseling. Uh, so I think, I think it's counseling the culturally diverse. And so literally in the beginning of the book and of later editions, he talks about these kind of responses, feedbacks that are these classic statements, and then he breaks them down. So I actually have us do these kind of mess ups and then say, okay, these are the ways where it, you could have said it like this, and this would have been the response, how that's connected to X, Y, and Z, whether it is a trauma trigger context, what it, whether it's a microaggression and how do you define that, etc. And so then we do either here's a way to kind of convey or respond to people without tripping down the same line or how do you do a process of repair. And after defining terms, that second, I always do like, how do you go through conversational faux pas? So before you get into any content, it's like a prerequisite for me. So it's like, you're saying, when do you discuss this? And I'm like, right at the beginning, because they happen all the time. Uh, And I also speak to this, like, 
whether it's you feel awkward because you don't know what to say, so you say nothing. You feel awkward, you don't know what to say, so you joke about things, committing microaggressions, that then oftentimes it's that lack of familiarity with the content that leads to a lot of the problems. And the group thing is big too, because I know that I, like for instance, I admin a WhatsApp group and it's just a co-living space here. And one of the things I talk about often is tourist colonialism and how affluent expats coming in are displacing local populations because they're driving up rent and other costs. I talk about it all the time. And yet, you know, I do host a co-living group where people can find housing. I just thought it was needed. And now it's a huge group. And somebody who is a local Portuguese person got on and was kind of trauma venting a bit. Um, but I said, let's follow this line for a little while because it's a great learning opportunity for everybody to then again become aware of it without me being like political. Uh, and that's what somebody said. They said something along the lines of, oh, this group is for this. It's not political. And I was like, I'm loving the fact that I am the one and only admin of this group. So I can say <laughs> everything is political. Every space is political and I'm the admin. So whereas I don't want people to be attacking and trauma offloading, I, for instance, suggested that we do an on-site kind of collaboration on this topic to shift the energy over. But I mean, articles were shared and it was nice because I was like, I can remember so many times people shutting things down. We don't talk about that here. Uh, and like, who got, to, who got to decide that? And then how it can really get ganged up in these digital spaces of really, really diminishing the opportunity to have these discussions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the spaces that we actually have are of not a perfect place to discuss things. And for these spaces, this is never mentioned that the, if you're meeting up with friends somewhere outside or like not in a dedicated political or activist context. For me, every discussion or everything that I talk about with someone is political in any way, and they're like it's never raised as a problem. Like sometimes discussions get very heated. Over. Yeah, I think it's super important to be wary of not letting online spaces be a safe space for very privileged or reactionary people. <laughs> for me, like something that's just really core to my being is I will not be moved. So if somebody's going to do something problematic or try to limit like these important expression points that you're saying, my stance is I will not be moved. If you're not shoving me, you know, then there's no reason that we can't coexist in this space because I'm not going to push my narrative. I can kind of read the room. And if I'm like, this is the space where I'm going to be honored for this discussion, I'll take that discussion elsewhere. But the second somebody pushes, I'm like, these are domination schematics. And whereas another person is going to be destabilized, is going to be made small by them, I know that not only do I have the capacity, emotional trauma capacity or what have you, but I also have the knowledge base to argue a lot of the nonsense. So I will not be the one that's moved because all of the people who come behind me, who, like you said, do not know how to have these discussions, but know that they're important to have or feel super diminished by these things being minimized. That I try to cultivate now is not just not being moved when I uh, don't want to, but also showing people that there is stability in constant movement, that pushing against someone often actually means first going back and then going forward, not taking the full blow, but taking the energy and giving it back uh, in the way that they can see then that the argument was flawed, that there's an error in the perspective or in the like uh, knowing where you actually have a handle and seeing that. And that's also something that discussions for me, it's often not necessarily about the argument themselves, but uh, also about the way, uh, like the timing that you put them in or I think that's that's also a problem with that people have in online spaces, um, chat rooms, or where, where uh, people have very different abilities in being present, typing, um, having actual time to be there. That after all, it's been like digital natives aren't haven't been a thing for too long, and having to learn both, like arguing in in person in the real world and also or arguing in online spaces it's two very different things and it's 
the old way of argument, uh, like discussing in text, just putting correspondences in letters or books or something there. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Uh, yeah, I do find it to be very destabilizing and I personally limit my notification. I don't go into threads on Facebook a lot of times because people do not read and they're going to argue an opinion that wasn't actually backed up in any way or there's this idea that any opinion is a fact. I even like when I do my postings, I use a third party software. So like everything's generated there and then it posts to my social so I don't have to engage it. Um, and I just noticed in terms of neurodivergence that it's just so much more balancing for my mental health long term to not have that level of engagement. So I hear you. And in fact, like this political thing in the group is because I'm like, I'm the admin. I have a responsibility here. I created this group. So I was like, after the day and a half of these uh, messages, I was like, Whoa, I'm so glad we're done. Because <laughs> It's a lot. Um, and I was thinking also in terms of like how you respond uh, communication, because it's not just timing, it's also tone and volume and your physical stance. And I will do this thing where I often call myself a mirror. So if somebody like um, has a hard time emotionally regulating when they're in a conflict-based discussion, and they do things like stand over you or yell, you know, if it's somebody who I care about and I know that they're struggling with mental health, for instance, I myself will raise up and for maybe three words, I will match their tone. And then they'll be like, and I'll, and I'll, and then I'll go completely back down to, okay, I'm sitting and I'm speaking slower and I'm speaking softer and can you greet me here? Can we have this discussion here now? Because I, I just showed you what it feels like to have you communicate at me that way. And I do find it is sometimes helpful also to just honor that we do have trauma triggers and we do have these times where we need to release energy and being aware of that and then designating time for that is, is super powerful. It's something I did in organizing spaces for years. I started doing inter interpersonal relationships in housing structures because, of course, like, we would do it in communities, but now doing it in a housemate situations where I'm like, okay, once a week, this is our time to sit and kind of bring our confusions, concerns, so that they don't start to bubble and then they spew. And so rather than having that, we have a regular set time. And of course, having the first few times be almost so little to even say that it's just about familiarizing the process. And I'm noticing how real, really served I am by having these process-oriented things throughout my life.